Hello, hell of a way, listeners. Just a quick heads up. This episode was recorded as a bonus. However, because of a change in schedule, we needed to release it as the free one. would also say, please check out this week's bonus. If you're a Patreon subscriber, we interview Rolling Stone journalist and Army veteran Seth Harp about his piece covering a spate of unexplained deaths and murders at Fort Bragg. That's on the $5 tier on Patreon. And if you sign up, you will have access to all of the bonus content we have put out since we started the show in 2016. Thanks again for listening, and I hope you enjoy. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. Glory, glory, what a hell of a way to die. He ain't gonna jump no more. So- Hello, everyone, and welcome to another bonus episode of What a Hell of a Way to Die. Uh, it's me, Nate. Francis is still on vacation, and uh, I am joined today by a friend of the show and journalist for The Intercept, Ken Klippenstein. How's it going, Ken? Hey, it's going all right. So I brought you on because you had two pieces in rapid succession that were interesting, I think, to, definitely to me and, and certainly, I think, to our listeners as well. Um, one of them was about uh, Trump's Justice Department trying to intimidate researchers about their findings with regard to the absence, in their case, of fraud in the Bolivian elections. And another one was about um, the uh, Customs and Border Patrol trying to, uh, or Customs and Border Protection, trying to get in the game of buying anti-drone devices. So I wanted to talk about the Bolivia one first, if we could, if you wouldn't mind just kind of like laying it out for our listeners. Yeah. So what was so striking was um, the parallels that I found, and I wrote this with Ryan Graham as well, that we found uh, between the Trump administration's, uh, you know, quote, stop the steal uh, push to call into question the election results that, that Biden had won, and how um, not only did Bolivia echo a lot of those same sorts of claims, but it seems like um, aspects of the U.S. government were helping them do that as well. So essentially what I found, um, the story is based on a series of emails from the Justice Department sent to a couple of MIT researchers who were working on contract uh, for a for the Center for Economic and Policy Research uh, to investigate these claims that um, the election of uh, in which Evo Morales won the first indigenous president who was running for I believe it was his fourth term mm-hmm. uh, just to give you a bit of the uh, context here he's you know broadly popular among uh, the indigenous who comprise about forty percent of the country um, that's not quite a majority but it's definitely the plurality of people and historically uh, prior to Evo Morales uh, government, this country had been run by, you know, people of European descent for hundreds and hundreds of years. So this was, you know, very significant for him to win. And that's, that was sort of the context of this campaign between him and uh, this very, you know, far right person, uh, Agnes, Jeanine Agnes, who herself um, didn't, you know, have anyone in her cabinet who was uh, indigenous and came under a lot of criticism for that and had a kind of like racially tinged criticisms of Morales. Yeah, uh, in the past, where he, she called him a quote poor Indian, and uh, she's implied that indigenous people can't wear shoes. So there's definitely a you know racial uh, dimension to all this. Completely aside from the economic differences, which is you know she as soon as she came in starts taking up all of these IMF loans, um, and you know just doing stuff that you would imagine the U.S. would want them to do, a very pro business kind of thing. Yeah, I remember this taking place, and there was significant protest and violence. Uh, you know, I remember the military killing people in Bolivia. I remember seeing scenes that people shared on Twitter of churches where they were basically corralling the bodies of injured and wounded people who uh, had been, you know, killed in some cases uh, during protests, clashes with the regime. And the thing that was was so shocking about it was, like you said, it, Morales's um, results were good. He had won. But they claimed that because, if I remember correctly, it was like the fact that rural votes where he was more popular took longer to come in and the fact that the election website glitched for like a couple of minutes was enough for the uh, Organization of American States to basically condemn this as election fraud. And that ushered in a military coup that then installed Añez. And uh, basically, um, Morales' party won in a subsequent election. Um, Añez had not run for office. She wound up, I believe, standing down and then getting arrested on charges of terrorism and various other things. And um, it, it, once again, it was like, this OAS report or OAS claim was seen to be rushed and really bogus, but like that seemed to be all the top cover that people needed in what you might call sort of center right media, in which includes 
most, if not all, American media to claim that this was fraud and Morales was, you know, Hugo Chavez or you know, Nicolas Maduro, that, it, which is a little bit absurd considering, if I remember correctly, how Chavez won elections too. Um, but they basically right. were saying he's a dictator and blah, 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 and all this stuff. And that was enough top cover to, um, to tell people that, like, actually, this was, this was restoring democracy. You know, it's sort of like 1973, Augusto Pinochet murders Salvador Allende. And they're like, well, see, he, he restored democracy by creating a military dictatorship. It, it was the same thing happening under Añez, you know, in, in broad strokes. And we saw this happen. But then uh, this report from MIT comes out uh, that basically says, if I'm not mistaken, and, and you, you went into more detail in your article, that th- there were not inconsistencies, and this was not a fraudulent election. Yeah, that's exactly right. So these two um, academics that uh, researched this, and this is all just based on math. I mean, they're not you know, bringing in uh, all this new uh, data points. They're just looking at, uh, they conducted a statistical analysis, uh, which found essentially what you said, which is that, of course, there was a spike in votes uh, you know, l- later in the day, because his support comes from the indigenous who largely live in rural areas and their votes don't get counted first. And so everyone knew this. And moreover, they'd been pushing this stop the steal uh, narrative for uh, weeks prior. Uh, Ryan knew a lot more about this, Ryan Grimm, than I did. He starts to um, show me all this evidence that they've been trying to kind of, you know, prime the, not just the public, but crucially the international press for this idea that, uh, as you said, this scary dictator Morales is going to, is going to steal the election. And so um, in, in pushing this, you know, claim that really has very little evidence and that uh, this mathematical analysis showed, um, you know, just didn't have a leg to stand on. Uh, the New York Times and the major press in the United States, uh, you know, did a real assist uh, to the to the Anya's regime in, in helping to grant legitimacy to this stuff. So once they did the military coup, that looked kind of ugly. And so they had to kind of, you know, paper over that. And so the amount of um, just hand wringing over in an unwillingness to call, you know, what is a military takeover, that's a coup, the unwillingness to use that word was sort of comical at times. I included some quotes in the story, uh, maybe, maybe one of the best ones, but this was certainly not um, outside of uh, kind of the the range of uh, you know respected opinion among uh, the major media outlets in the U.S. Was Max Fisher writing for the New York Times? He says, "quote The line between coups and revolt can be blurry, even non-existent." And then he goes on to say, <laughs> he cites a political scientist, uh, Jay Olfelder. He he says he calls it Schrodinger's coup, cases in which. Uh, there exists a perpetual state of ambiguity, simultaneously coup and not coup. And then he goes on to dismiss the distinction as, quote, old binaries now considered outdated by scholars. Uh, that's, I so mean, what I feel even, like. What even is a coup? You know, who are, uh, yes. <laughs> what is reality? What are words? Yeah, exactly. It's <laughs> like when you, when you see the military take over and install a right wing leader and use, you know, violence and deadly force to suppress any kinds of, uh, opposition to that then it's like and and you know if i'm not mistaken morales had to flee the country like yep. yeah like he he had to sneak out basically and get away because they were going to arrest him and put him on trial and like there was all this stuff where you know all of the things that you would normally if you had your like it's a coup bingo card were getting ticked off one at a time either like rhetorically or factually and yeah this was the people didn't want to admit that because my take on it was it, it struck me that in the sort of center right liberal sphere, it seems like a lot of these pink tide governments that you know Latin American populist governments you want to call it populism. You know, populism is kind of a scary word to people, but like popular governments primarily made up of support from workers, from laborers, not from landed elites, uh, winning in countries like. Venezuela and Brazil and Bolivia this this basically in um in Ecuador too I believe and like this stuff th- while th- I, my I think I, I spoke to Vincent Bevins about this and he said like you're not wrong in in presuming that the United States was so fixated post 9/11 on the Middle East that they stopped doing the you know putting the effort in to disrupt th- these kinds of movements and as a result you saw left wing governments and you see you know, the possibilities for this stuff in other countries like Chile uh, happening recently. And it strikes me that Morales and people like Morales were really unpopular, not because of their performance as leaders or because of any kind of like, you know, misdeeds on their part, but just because of what they represented to the sort of like IMF brain, if you will. And so in a way, 
it, what what struck me was that two things. This felt like number one, a warm up to what would happen if if they uh, were successful in overthrowing um, Maduro in Venezuela. But I think more importantly, this was an opportunity to do all of the like destroy labor unions, IMF reforms kind of shit that has happened in, in countries you know around the world where where the economies have been forcibly liberalized. Uh, this was an opportunity to do that, and they didn't want the stain of a coup of you know illegality or you know a military takeover uh, spoiling the fun of you know liberalizing one of the biggest support or our biggest suppliers of lithium, for example, in the world. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, just there's the colonial history. I mean, they, these, this region had been different to the United States for 500 years or to North America for the colonists for, you know, 500 years. And so I think there was an attitude, at, you know, in the post 9-11 era of that, well, they've never really meaningfully pursued independence. So <laughs> why would it start now? And then boom, of course it happens. And so that's sort of the backdrop mm -hmm. against which all this is happening. Yeah, and, and um, you look at it like there's been, you know, unsuccessful, but certainly like prominent military challenges uh, to, you know, Hugo Chavez and subsequently to, uh, to Maduro, Nicolas Maduro. Um, there's been, you know, they, they via uh, Lava Jato, they, they basically undid um, uh, Luis Ignacio da Silva's legacy in Brazil and put Dilma Rousseff in in prison um uh, you know they impeached her at least and uh I, and, and and subsequently this stuff has happened under trump but also under obama there was absolutely like a reaction to it um because it struck me that this kind of thing well they didn't want they didn't want it to happen they didn't want it to be popular they didn't want the supply chain to be disrupted if you put it that way and so this report uh in your article you have evidence that the doj basically tried to threaten the people who wrote the report. Yeah. So this mathematical analysis um, that was published by these MIT researchers in the Washington Post, that sort of sent a lot of shockwaves out because uh, as I was saying before, the New York Times and the Post as well had, you know, echoed a lot of these claims. Oh, look, they're, you know, they're claiming election fraud. And then the OAS, um, which by the way, is based in Washington, receives most of its funding from Washington, but it's sort of by the Western press treated as this kind of UN body, even though it's not. Um, you know, they come out uh, making these, you know, a lot of innuendo about, oh, that is strange that uh, that that Morales um, won and that the numbers changed um, so dramatically. And so what they showed just by looking at the math of it was that um, there's there's, you know, extremely small statistical probability that even assuming all that stuff was true. Just look at the numbers that 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 there was any sort of credence to any of that. And so that gets published in the post. Um, huge response in Latin America because it's like a you know major U.S. outlet basically just saying all this entire narrative was false. Um, kind of embarrassment on the part of um, uh, U.S. media because the New York Times then has to publish that and they have a kind of wishy-washy article on how yeah it looks like maybe it wasn't exactly what we thought but you know there's still questions maybe who knows maybe Morales did something else that kind of thing so it created a lot of sort of um, uh, political embarrassment I think. Um, and, and, you know, was windowed out of sales for the uh, Socialist Party in Bolivia. And so what ends up happening in 20, uh, later in 2019, um, running right up to this year, uh, right before Biden was inaugurated, the Justice Department sent uh, emails to these two researchers and eventually under threat of subpoena, asked them to answer some questions about, you know, how they found this stuff. And it was kind of funny because at the beginning, the, um, it's a trial attorney contacting them. And I know people in FBI and DOJ, and they tell me that's extremely unusual to have the actual attorney or prosecutor questioning the person themselves. Usually they have trained law enforcement. It's the Justice Department. They have the FBI who's extensively trained in interview techniques, elicitation. Um, so it's very strange that they would have uh, uh, the prosecutor handling that. In any case, um, they sent them these emails. They asked them questions about it. It wasn't, it wasn't super clear what the questions uh, were trying to get at. Because if you look at the emails, uh, she's saying to these researchers, she says, was this report real? And if you look at their response, they're kind of like, what, uh, like, what do you mean? Like, it's a, it's a mathematical analysis. Like, we're not making any claims of anonymous sources or, or outside information or anything. Like, the, you know, and the data they use is open source. They include, uh, you know, the, the, the data and in, in, in how they, like, what kind of uh, statistical tools and methods they use to look at it. I mean, you can review it. It's all just sitting there. And she, uh, you know, keeps kind of pressing them. And I, you know, I have to say, it's hard to see this as anything other than 
trying to, uh, you know, freak these folks out. And from what I understand, a lot of people in the academic community were scared. And suddenly there's this attitude that, oh God, if you start, you know, looking at these claims of Latin America, maybe we're going to have more, maybe we're going to have some legal headaches from the Justice Department. And this goes on for months and months. That's completely insane, but also not necessarily surprising given that it did strike me that um, if you look at the way Trump behaved internationally, there weren't a lot of big moves in sen- like Iraq war style, but there was definitely an attempt to support anything that would, you know, allow, uh, I don't know, I, sound, I feel like I sound like a crank saying this, but like, you know, you don't put the Exxon CEO as your uh, right. secretary of state if you're not trying to send a signal about, you know, whose interests you're safeguarding. And so when you look at stuff like this, you look at, um, you know, all of the stuff about Juan Waido and trying to, you know, and, and, and some of this was bipartisan, but a lot of this under Trump to basically, you know, one way or the other forcibly install Juan Waido as the leader of Venezuela or in this case, supporting the coup against Morales, um, you know, or the insane levels of coziness with Jair Bolsonaro when he won in 2016, a correction in um, 2018, rather. And, uh, you know, it's just, it doesn't surprise me, but I think the the sort of threat of lawfare against American researchers by the US DOJ just my read on it is it just sort of seems like what they would do internationally but brought back to America exactly and it wasn't just the justice department when i first saw this i was kind of like well maybe it was some crazy wing of doj that was off on some nonsense but then um it, it was uh, i was able to find in spanish language this was never published in english um, Voice of America, the U.S. government uh, funded, you know, media apparatus. It's kind of like the United States RT mm-hmm. um, based in uh, in Bolivia. They put out a report um, essentially threatening those same researchers and saying this was fake news. And again, echoing language very similar to the kind of stuff that Trump says um, in saying and in, 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 in commenting on the possibility of uh, criminal prosecution of those individuals. And this is coming from a U.S. government funded outlet naming U.S. academics, and not that you should enjoy more protection, you know, if you're a prominent person, but these are MIT researchers. This is not, these are pretty, you know, respected people. It's, I don't think I've seen anything like this in, in, in recent time. I mean, again, this is stuff that traditionally they do to people in client states, but in this case, it was, you know, multiple agencies of the U.S. government seemingly targeting um, American citizens at a, you know, very respected research institution. So I think everyone was just sort of surprised by that. And the, re- the kind of academics in that area I talked to, they'd never seen anything like that happen either. And what's weird to me too is that you feel as though there's also the implicit threat, like beyond the whole, like, we're going to subpoena you in- unless you give us your sources, even when it's open source. There's also the fact that, like, any major American institution, regardless of whether it's public or private, is going to have federal funding for research. Like, that's a big right. thing for, especially a right. place like MIT, which is like a flagship for research in America. And so the idea being there that, you are not just doing this to target the individual researchers. You're also, you know, sending a great big signal to their bosses, uh, you know, to, to, to basically inhibit this from happening again. It's interesting you bring that up. I mean, Trump was very explicit about, um, and the education secretary that he appointed, uh, they were repeatedly saying, we're going to withhold grants and things like that. If you don't, I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was the Israel Palestine issue. They were upset that there were some, um, groups critical of you know Israeli foreign policy in the in the occupied territories, and so uh, they very explicitly made these statements that like yeah we're going to withhold uh, I don't remember what Title Eight uh, funding or something like that um, unless you unless you get these things in order. So that subtext is really important. There was some uh, editor on Twitter that was saying oh these emails were just asking questions. What's the big deal here? That misses the whole subtext of that in the context in the context of academia. You're always desperate for money. Yes. Everyone's nervous and, and it's really hard to get tenure. So this kind of thing, you'd have to be, you're, I mean, it's just not realistic to think that people are not going to take from this. Oh God, I guess we shouldn't, it's not, you know, it's not going to, it's going to hurt your career prospects if you, if you keep investigating these kind of things. Yeah. And also that, I mean, in a situation like this, if they're, if the DOJ is contacting people, it's not just a matter of, hey, you know, they found your your email on Global or something like that, or like on the, the university's website and they're contacting you. Like, they're going to contact you through your, your institution. Everyone's going to know. 
all of the higher ups are going to know. And like the the I almost said civilian, but it's not it's not military. But you know what I mean, like the non academic leadership at the university, they're going to know. Totally. And so Why would they put this in email? Because then it's going to come out, and it's almost like, well, that was the idea. Because again, I have a lot of sources in FBI. This is not how you go about conducting a criminal investigation. Usually, you do that. You you pay them a physical visit. You talk to them verbally because you don't want there to be a paper trail of what's going on, um, unless your goal is not to conduct an ordinary criminal investigation. Which, yeah, it makes it seem as though the point here was to send a message. And uh, I mean, not surprised, but I guess the brazenness of it and the fact that it's not even really like this isn't because of it being a domestic issue. You know, like this isn't something with regard to like, think about some of the ways they tried to pressure people to not count votes in places like Georgia or uh, Michigan or Wisconsin, stuff like that. You know, like I'm not saying that you, you excuse that behavior, but you understand the sort of impetus behind it that here's a, you know, a, a more or less uh, fuck the laws party saying we're going to get what we want one way or the other and like we don't want you to think your job is to interpret the law if it doesn't mean giving us what we want i understand even though like obviously like massively opposed to this but i understand how that would happen but when it's something like on behalf of a coup regime in latin america it just seems really brazen and it feels like the only reason you could understand why they do this is if you see that like they are that ideologically committed to what that coup government, what that you know um, anti-socialist, anti-moralist sentiment meant. Like that's they identify with that so strongly that they're willing to, like you said, leave a paper trail in a situation where, under normal circumstances, even if you were investigating criminal misconduct in America, you wouldn't do. That's exactly right. And Trump was very close to these guys. I know that on you know, for example, on January sixth, Bolsonaro's son. Uh, during the Capitol riot, he was there, and if I, if I recall, he was making statements of support in the uh, for the demonstrations. I don't remember if he, you know, explicitly called on them to, you know, pursue any kind of violence. But I mean, th- these administrations are very close, and you can tell in the um, rhetoric that uh, Anya's adopted that she was cleaving very closely to MAGA, and and that these types of administrations perceive Washington as their only path to power because they're not able to win legitimate elections otherwise it's just that's just how it is so what in your opinion is the sort of rhetorical similarity between this and the january 6th riot because i know you brought up some links in your piece with regard to the way in which it was framed and the way in which uh the, the 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 people you know trying to justify the action of you know denying a what's it called a like a legitimate election um but like do you see besides the sort of similarities in terms of all right this is two groups of people who are saying we want to find a way to cancel an election result after the fact what what other similarities did you see well the fact that this wasn't spontaneous uh you know to say that january 6th was spontaneous would be to ignore the weeks prior of the president <laughs> president trump getting out and saying you know this was stolen they and you know to something that's amazing to me it was the if you don't think that that kind of rhetoric and that if some percentage of the country believes that's true, of course you're going to take up arms and do something because the government was overthrown and stolen in your mind. So they had been priming the pump in that exact same way, going back weeks in, uh, and also in the, the, the Latin American press too, raising all these questions about something that hadn't even happened yet. There had been no election and they were already saying, watch out, it might get stolen. <laughs> so, um, you know, this is clearly planned and there was clearly for the you know u.s press to pick this up as they did and act as though it just oh wow look at this everyone's angry about um the election and and all these spontaneous protests and not to realize that there was some kind of um you know uh uh attempt on the part of the administration to shape those perceptions is just so naive and and it misunderstands what exactly happened there because there were protests but again it's following all of that and then to call the military in, it was kind of like if January 6th had succeeded, essentially, they were able to um, throw out the result, which was that um, Morales won, get the military to um, you know push them out and install her. So the difference was that the U.S. Uh, perhaps is, is 
you know, not quite as, is, is their institutions aren't quite as weak in terms of being able to, um, you know, be pushed around like that. But it, it, to me, it seems pretty similar, uh, just what they were trying to do. Yeah. And it's funny because I do recall some people making this comparison, talking about, if not explicitly referencing Bolivia, then saying, well, you know, there is this likelihood that uh, if results come in late and the late results change the predictions, that it's going to, you know, cause unrest. And people were specifically saying, like, look, because of the pandemic, we are going to have a lot of postal votes. Because of that, it's very likely that places with high population densities are going to take longer to count than places with low population densities, which in America almost completely maps out to, you know, Republicans versus Democrats. And that this, it's entirely likely that, you know, on the, at the end of election day in America, it's going to look like Trump is winning. And then the count is going to reveal that actually, no, Trump didn't stand a chance of winning in a lot of these places. Um, and I mean, I think that's, that was borne out in many states that were contested, you know, in places like Wisconsin or uh, in Georgia or in, in Pennsylvania, even because of how strong of a Democratic uh, bastion Philadelphia is and the fact that it took forever to, uh, to, to count those votes. Um, you know, people are saying like, this is going to cause unrest. This people are going to try to make this into a conspiracy when it's obviously not. And something that was really interesting to me was seeing that and seeing the concern and the, you know, like the, the sort of foreboding on the part of people who, you know, are writing for established outlets like the Times and places like that and not making the connection that like, oh, you mean Trump's going to do the thing that they did in Bolivia that you supported? Exactly. And that's what I'm trying to point out with this piece is um, that you can't do those things internationally without it coming home. There's this insane idea that you can conduct, uh, you know, I- imperialism uh, and, and have it happen over there and not, and, but here we have civil liberties and freedoms and things. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not suggesting a sort of equivalency, obviously, you know, uh, what happens to people in Iraq is, is, you know, far worse than, than what happens to us. Um, but, it, but at the same time, it's naive to think that there's not going to be some kind of, um, blowback and that, um, the, the attitudes that you have to accept in order to do those sorts of things are not going to cause some kind of erosion of, of, of you know, the democratic system domestically as well. Yeah. And one of the things that I was thinking about when I read this piece was just the extent to which this kind of story has happened many times before in many places, but there, it was easier to see stuff on the ground and hear from contrary voices in Bolivia because of the way that so much of this was reported on social media. And in that regard, I think it was easier. It still didn't go the way people wanted right away. Obviously, there was this period of dictatorship where it was just immensely detrimental to people in Bolivia. But there was less ammunition or maybe less credence for the complete garbage argument that this was, you know, Morales committing electoral fraud because of the fact that so much of this stuff was published on the internet and the repression was shown on the internet and things along those lines. And it did feel like it didn't take as long to get people who, you know, weren't just full on, you know, like World Bank brain lords uh, to see that this was such an obvious fraud that Anya's and that coup government was committing. And so to me, like, in a way, it feels like, especially when you said that this was happening right before Trump left office, this, this memo to MIT the fact that people were still that diehard about it, like trying to, you know, punish the people who who uh, made the coup government look bad via the US DOJ, that this was the US DOJ, you know, acting, one presumes on instructions from someone in Trump's inner circle to do this. Very like, clearly. I want to point that out too. Uh, when I talk to people that I know in the Justice Department, something like this does not happen. At the, uh, there was someone, there was some editor was complaining about how, oh, it's a mid-level DOJ employee. You're legally, you're not the the or the Justice Department's. They they have a they have a set of guidelines for interactions with the media and the press because they want to avoid, um, you know, a scandal. I was gonna say this so, kind of thing. Yeah, you need you exactly. You need authorization from the uh, either Attorney General or Deputy Attorney General uh, to question a member of either academia or the press like this. So this would have required, and this is something I was told by you know people that worked in that office too. This would have required sign sign off from someone 
very high up that would be in touch with the White House. That's that's wild to me. I'm not surprised, but that's completely wild to me. Well, I'm glad that you were able to get this out there. I'm glad that uh, I presume that uh, that this got leaked to you. I don't know if that's how you end up getting the emails. Yep. That's awesome. I'm really glad that people share this because, my God, like I'm glad people can see the extent to which, you know, we have talked about this before on this show, and I've certainly seen it elsewhere, that one of the angles by which stuff like Lava Jato happened in Brazil was just sort of lawfare. It was just, you know, shadow money, dark money funding lawsuits and things along those lines like think think uh you know a bullshit u.s supreme court case you know brought on by the Koch brothers but just done with way more severity and with way less accountability in these countries to inhibit um you know people taking office if they're left wing or you know stop policies from going forward or you know keep coup governments in power like this is this is absolutely a problem and and threatening people who speak out threatening you know killing journalists harassing editors um, harassing academics, all this stuff, it doesn't surprise me. And I mean, you know, this kind of thing has happened before uh, at the behest of foreign heads of state or you know, senior foreign people. When I think about, um, there was a guy um, in Washington, D.C., who was the former Chilean ambassador to the U.S., I believe his name was Orlando Letelier. He had served in Allende's government. And uh, the Chilean secret service, like like security services, Dina, um, killed him via a car bomb in 1978 in Washington, D.C. On killed, Embassy Row. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And killed ki- him on Embassy Row. And killed him and killed his, his secretary, who was an American citizen. Uh, or similarly, in Chile, I want to say in the mid-80s, uh, there was a, a dual U.S. Chilean citizen. He was a, a young man. I think he was like 17 or 18. So he's still a kid, really, who went down went home to Chile and was protesting and was basically kettled and the cops beat him up and then set him on fire and uh, he died. And uh, Jesse Helms, at the time, a US senator, sent his people down to basically run press sort of like opposition or, or um, you know, interference to stop this from becoming a scandal that would make Pinochet's government look bad. So these kinds of things have happened before and like there's been, you know, cooperation from from people in the US. But I think the thing that it's like a cliche almost to say that it comes home, but like, here's an example of it coming home. Here's an example of them doing what they would do in Bolivia or in Chile or in Ecuador or in Venezuela or in Argentina, but doing it to American academics. And it's like, Trump might be out of office, but like that impetus, that sort of like no rules apply. We do what the fuck we want. Power lets us do anything. Like, it's not as if that's, that's no longer the Republican ethos in America. Yeah. And I still, I mean, yes, it's a cliche, but it's one that people haven't absorbed because you see, I see people, just ordinary people make, for for example, with uh, vaccines, make the argument, well, you know, you're vaccinated. Why do you care if the third world does that? Not understanding that you can't isolate the safety of, uh, you know, North America from the rest of the world, because um, if there's, you know, if India becomes a Petri dish for these uh, diseases, then the the virus mutates and becomes dangerous uh, to all of us. You can't, it's just like, yes, this is a, this is a familiar refrain. It comes home, but no, people haven't absorbed it yet. So it's still important. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, there was a guy here in Britain who had a really weak immune system. He went up dying from it, but he was continually sick with it. His guy in like Kent, I think, like, you know, one of the home counties of London. Um, and he was, they believe the origin of the UK variant. Like it developed wow. in his body because he just continually kept, you know, was getting reinfected. And it wound up, yeah, developing this variant that then spread and that has now become, I believe, like one of the dominant variants in the US. And so it's like, yeah, like you just said, if you if you treat these things like, oh, well, you know, that's over there, not here. I mean, you look at what happened in Iraq and you look at the way that Iraq was sort of pacified and it's not too dissimilar to some of the things you see the way, you know, police tactics have changed in the last, you know, 17, 18 years in America. And so to me, like, that sort of militarization or, you know, really aggressive lawfare, all that stuff, like, it's not as though that's going to stay quarantined outside of the United States or Canada or, you know, anywhere in the developed world, if you will. Yeah. I mean, if you want to talk about policing, they literally have surplus DOD equipment from those wars (laughs) that are just sitting around. And so I wish that that stuff would get factored in when we make, when the public makes determinations about wars, because it's not just are you going to go in there? It's, 
um, invariably there will be surplus equipment that will get sent back. And is this conflict worth <laughs> having like, uh, you know, a pimped out police force that's just, you know, has equipment way beyond what any, you know, comparable Western I mean, country better, would. better than what we, um, I, I don't like being like, oh, well, we, we deserve better gear. But like here, let me tell you, when I see some of the kit that cops, regular cops wear in, you know, protests in America, it's more expensive, higher dollar value, like more refined, better engineered kit than what we were issued when I was in an airborne unit in Afghanistan. Like genuinely better stuff. And that stuff's not cheap at all. And so it's like, every time I see that, I'm just like, well, sweet. That's one more school that doesn't get fucking, you know, new textbooks. But also those people are killing people and getting away with it. And so it's just... Yeah, man. Well, I mean, it's funny because we bring that up because that's a pretty good segue to the next story I wanted to talk about, which was uh, you had another scoop basically showing that uh, Customs and Border Protection wants to start acquiring anti-drone equipment and has an enormous like like 100 plus million budget for this kind of a thing, anti-drone equipment. And it sounds from what you've described in your reporting like this could ostensibly lead to in the name of combating drones having armed drones on the border yeah so the budget for it is huge just for this fiscal year the um, defense department they spent um at least 404 million dollars uh on research and development for these counter drone technologies and then another 83 million on procurement so this is a huge chunk of cash and my impression from people that i know in customs and border protection and dhs is that there's just so many contracts floating around there's so much largesse from the government uh, for, for this particular thing that again, <laughs> naturally, other people want to buy to that, and every, you know, there's a huge burgeoning business. And they're producing all these things. They've got extra stuff they don't need. They have surplus equipment, and then suddenly, lo and behold, uh, Customs and Border Protection says, "Hey, why can't we get some of that stuff too? We'd be useful for the southern border." And uh, I don't think it's not like there's no argument to make for that because there are cartels uh, that have been using them for mostly for reconnaissance purposes. In some cases, they've used uh, small drones to drop. Um, I think. Uh, grenades and and small small bombs on but this is like this is cartel and cartel violence um for you know cbp to say oh they're going to come do this to you next it's <laughs> i don't think that's really you know how it's going to work but there's there's some argument for for you know we have to counter small drones um but the problem is this is being done in secret i can't find any sort of reporting about the fact that uh this could open up you know a whole suite of uh technical capabilities that CBP doesn't currently have. So a lot of people don't know this, but CBP, they have a whole, they have, a, they basically have their own air force. It's called air Marine operations. And within that, they've got Reaper drones. Uh, one prominent case people might recognize was during the George Floyd protests, CBP used one of these uh, Reaper drone, drones to um, conduct surveillance. And this was like a big controversy. People, I saw a lot of people that were like, Oh my God, when did they get a drone? <laughs> and, you know, I'm glad that they care about it. And uh, I don't blame them for not knowing because this stuff is not, you know, widely reported. But they have a whole fleet of not just Reapers, um, but they also have uh, Predator drones. They have, um, you know, uh, Cessnas uh, that they can, you know, have their own kind of surveillance equipment attached to it. So they've got a lot of this stuff. And this seems to be the next um, sort of upgrade that they're, that they're pushing for. Um, and interestingly, Congress, a year or two ago, uh, they authorized Department of Homeland Security, of which um, Customs and Border Protection is a, is a part. Uh, they gave them broad authority to shoot down other drones, uh, essentially needing to only say that they pose a threat. So um, you do the math. They need counter drone technology. Uh, there was a there was a um, there was a demonstration by the Defense Department, who's working closely. I know for a fact with CBP to help them develop these things because they just don't have the expertise to do that um, to shoot down other drones. And uh, so at the southern border um, in Yuma, which is a huge, you know, migrant crossing area, uh, they had a demonstration of a drone that could shoot a net at another drone to kind of knock it down. Um, and just <laughs> like, I don't know this for a fact, but I mean, I don't see how it, they don't go from this to, oh, why don't we just put a gun on it? Or why don't we, you know, have some kind of projectile that we can launch at another drone? And I just wish we could talk about this and say, okay, if we're going to do this, how, you know, what are the rules here? Because there's been none of that discussion. All is being done secret. Yeah, and, and I've noticed this too, that, I mean, there has definitely been a shift in rhetoric uh, under Biden with regard to the border that, you know, it's almost like people have talked about this before, that they've dialed back a lot of their 
claims about the facilities for you know unaccompanied minors and the holding facilities and some of the things they do that were where you know people were hoping for it to be more humane and you know i perhaps folks who don't follow this stuff closely may not realize that like some of the really egregious cruel practices developed under obama and so Biden as vice president at the time, like this, this would be more or less a continuation of what, what we saw under Obama and then subsequently under Trump. But I think the thing that really surprises me when I hear these stories is that, you know, this stuff, like you even showed it when you were talking about the whole migrant caravan kind of like hype where they were, they were, you know, this was the military was doing named areas of interest and talking about all sorts of things like, like a military operation when Trump deployed troops to the border and this, this stuff, it's not play acting. I mean, like this is the U S and on U S soil and, you know, customs and border protection have this remit to do stuff, I believe without warrants within a hundred miles of any U S border, which is basically almost everywhere in the U S like if you live in Oklahoma Everywhere city, anyone would actually live. Yeah. If you live in Oklahoma live city, you, you might be okay. But like basically either by a land border or by the ocean with a hundred miles of any of that on either. So like, think about that. If you live in, in New York city, that's you. Cause you know, you got the Atlantic ocean right there. If you live in Boston, that's you, you've got the Atlantic ocean and further up in New England, you go the closer to the Canadian border you go. If you live in Minneapolis, that's you. If you live in Chicago, that's you. If you live anywhere in, uh, in the South, like on the Southern coast, the Gulf coast, you live anywhere, basically anywhere uh, aside from like really far inland California, that's you. And so it's just like any power that they have, any remit they're granted to use this equipment, to have armed surveillance everywhere, like when it gets framed as a border thing, people are always like, well, you know, they want to stop, stop migrant trafficking and so on and so forth. And it's like, well, all right, I don't buy that argument. But even if you did buy that argument, you must understand that like when they say the border, the border is basically everywhere in America. Right, right. Yeah. And this is law enforcement. It, you know, it's not treated like the military is. It's one thing, uh, as you know, President Trump did to declare an emergency over immigration, undocumented immigration, and di- and dispatch the military southern border. Um, which, by the way, uh, Biden did um, re- reverse that executive order, but he kept a lot of the military there. Um, but at least the military has certain um, oversight rules. Uh, you know, people recognize posse comitatus, but there are a lot of rules around. Uh, you know, governing how how the military operates domestically. That's not the case with Customs and Border Protection. That's not the case with law enforcement. And that's why I think it's so much more dangerous for them to get some of these tools, which was always going to happen when you're developing these things in DOD, because then you create a whole uh, lucrative industry around this for people to manufacture things. And suddenly they're going to have more of it than they need. And that, (laughs) that just ends up in police's hands usually. And again, I wish that would be factored in when we decide what we're going to manufacture. It's interesting to me too, because like when you think about armed drones being in their arsenal you know i'm not i'm not the best on munitions so i'm not an expert by any means but i can only imagine that most of the use cases for drones well there is like an air to air capability i believe in a lot of cases this is air to land so it's like you know who are they going to be targeting with for example predators or reapers you know and it's like the argument gets made with well, cartels, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, well, yeah, maybe, but the overwhelming majority of what that surveillance is going to be is either going to be migrants or residents of the U.S. going about their business. And it freaks me out to think that you, know, you think about how easy it is to, you know, we've seen it over and over again in the last, you know, 20 years, is how easy it is for uh, a strike to get justified or authorized and then you know it turns out to be completely wrong and everyone you know shrugs their shoulders about it like i don't think it's too you don't have to go down the route of being like super worst case dystopian thinking to envision that taking place you know with the justification of border security 100 percent. i mean i got leaked one of the um technical specification documents for how they're creating these um aircraft and drones. And what's fascinating about it is they list the threats that justify the creation of, of this, you know, counter drone apparatus of, um, of their air assets and the changes they want to make to it. And, um, right underneath cartels is undocumented migrants. They consider that a threat. It's listed in the same category as, um, as the, as the, as the actual drug gangs that are sort of the worst case that you think of as being, 
um, something that approaches their, you know, their only really compelling argument for this kind of thing. So they're not going to, I don't think they're going to meaningfully differentiate. And the other thing is um, when, you know, migrants are crossing, sometimes uh, cartels use them for cover uh, for their own, you know, uh, selfish purposes. So it's like, I, I just don't think it's realistic to believe that there's going to be a ton of hand wringing and caution around uh, distinguishing between those two groups. Yeah. And I also am concerned too. Um, one thing that I think people don't talk about a lot, but I think is also a, a meaningful concern is the way that this gets weaponized for water crossings, because a lot of what the, the military does in cooperation with stuff like the DEA is stopping or trying to stop shipments, small shipments, or sometimes lar- larger shipments, depending on where you are in the world. You know, larger shipments in a lot of cases being submersibles on the Pacific side, um, or smaller shipments, planes, etc., and boats trafficking through um, the the Caribbean Sea or through the Gulf of Mexico. And so, the thing about it is, though, is there's lots and lots of migrant crossings that take place that way too. Partic- particularly people crossing on boats from Tijuana into San Diego. That's a huge route for people to get into the United States. And so, you know, that's once again, that's CBP does that. CBP has boats, they have planes, they're out doing that. Like, you know, there was recent, recently an article in the New York Times where a reporter followed, uh, followed one of their, their boats along basically and, and saw like, you know, that these movements took place uh, when they thought that the, the flight hours were out and that the planes had, had, had been grounded in order to, you know, avoid that surveillance. But if you've got drones with weapons, like it just seems as though it's begging people to find themselves in a situation where someone's like, oh, well, we have to authorize a drone strike. And like, it sounds so, I don't know, I, it sounds like you're exaggerating, but it's not. Because like, once you have a weapon, you want to use it. Right. And just psychologically, inside of Customs and Border Protection, the way they, they call them, they don't call them undocumented migrants or even necessarily illegals. They say they're human traffickers. The psychology just does not really differentiate that much, you know? That they they can't because they have to arrest these folks, and again, in living in the real world, when you have a population of people that you have to go and throw in prisons and send back and do these things that you know are setting them back in life, it's not you're gonna. It's easier to do that job if you believe that that what they're doing is awful, you know. So um, they don't think of these things in the same way that ordinary Americans do. And as I understand it from your article, there have been cases of drug drops taking place via drone, but it's not as like that's the main route by which drugs are brought into the United States. No. In fact, the rise in drones, I was talking to an intelligence officer um, who works for CBP. Um, apparently, this has become more of a concern at the southern border to the extent that they've beefed up the um, not just the border wall, but just border enforcement generally. Uh, so it's kind of like with, with the war on drugs. The more pressure you bring to bear, they just find other methods to to uh, traffic these things. And so, um, with with human migration and with and with the uh, uh, you know uh, drug trade at the southern border, you put the wall up. Well, that just incentivizes either tunneling or finding ways above the wall or around it. So um, it it's kind of an illust- <laughs> It's kind of just a. It, it seems like an unintended consequence of the of the of the huge budget uh, that that the Trump administration brought to bear on enforcement. Yeah, and and my recollection of the way that a lot of this stuff goes down is that you know there are instances of of people you know migrants being forced to carry stuff which they can't really say no to because I mean the people who are forcing them can easily kill them if they want to and no one will say anything. But then also, I seem to recall um, when um, God was it El, El Chapo Joaquin Guzman when he um, escaped from prison. That like part of his escape route involved an incredibly elaborate series of tunnels that went under the U.S. border, I think via Arizona, but it might have been elsewhere. But like that, you know, when they explored these tunnels, like this isn't this isn't like, you know, a thing you, you worm through. Like we're talking, you know, they had like they had dug it out and put in a track with a motorcycle engine to f- basically ferry like mining carts worth of stuff. Like so the idea that. When you have things like that, and this is just one they know of, when they have things like that, the idea that they're going to use drones, which I mean, are calling way more attention to yourself than an underground tunnel. Like, I don't, I just, I can't for the life of me see, especially given how big a drone would have to be to haul like a significant amount of, of cargo, like, and how big of a target that would be, how much noise that would make, how much of a radar signature that would cause, or at least some kind of a signature if, if radar is not applicable here. Like, 
so the drones, like you were saying, don't strike me as a problem worthy of, okay, you can combat them in the way that you're combating, you know, law enforcement's going to combat illegal activity no matter what, but it doesn't strike me as this grand emergency that justifies basically providing, like, further militarizing and further granting powers to CBP. Yeah, I think a lot of the hysteria is um, coming from anxiety from the Defense Department um, that perhaps is more legitimate, at least in the context of their uh, foreign policy aims, uh, which I don't necessarily agree with. But um, I include as context in the story, uh, the uh, Iranian kind of drone swarm attack on this um, Saudi oil facility in, I think it was 2019. And this was a devastatingly successful attack, not in terms of you know, they probably could have done a lot more if they wanted to, but just of making the point that you can't stop us if we want to do this. So you can't, you know, you can't just act with complete abandon because we have at least some check on on what you're doing here. And so the Defense Department saw that. And I don't know what the solution is to it. I don't know if there is one because these drones are so cheap. They're so small. They're so quick. They don't emit a heat signature that you can target with the kind of um, weapon systems that we've been giving the Saudis for decades now. So, um, the Defense Department was extremely worried that there's something that there's a, uh, that's not just a check on Saudi, that's on the whole entire world. Because if, you know, if we go and do some crazy George Bush kind of regime change thing in Iran, they could, they could, um, you know, halt the entire global uh, oil trade upon which the whole, every, you know, the, all the global markets depend. So um, they're really worried about that, which that makes more sense to be worried about than this. But I think that um, domestic law enforcement has a tendency to sort of aping what what the military does and kind of being like yeah we've got it wow you know that that is really scary look at all and now there's all this literature out there about oh god look at how cheap these ineffective these small drones are for 200 bucks they could get around all your all your defenses but but there's not the understanding that well the military is a different set of adversaries than the the domestic law enforcement yeah exactly and that you know you you can't the cartels can't pull a killing Qasem Soleimani without there being a huge blowback (laughs) on their part you know, right. it's, or, that, or that they would even want to start to use these tools against civilians. These, you know, uh, it, it, whatever you say about, uh, uh, you know, El Chapo, I mean, these guys are not suicidal. You know, if they, if they target an American with that, that's a lot of heat. Well, on them. Yeah, I mean, I feel, like, I feel like there's an extent to which the popular consciousness and the sort of boogeyman talking about drug cartels and, you know, drug trafficking and like, let's not, let's not be around the bush. Like the, the cartels kill people all the time in horrible ways. Totally. But, Awful. Everyone in the region hates them. But the know? thing about it is, is that like, if you've ever known drug dealers, like they aren't trying to go around with a huge neon sign saying I'm committing crimes, you know, like they're not trying to draw any more attention to themselves. It's a business. Yeah, yeah exactly. They want to make profit. Yeah, exactly. And so the, the, it, to me, it feels like this is the argument you were making previously about defense anxieties, law enforcement aping the defense department, you know, a desire to get in on the budget, a desire to get in on the sort of like, you know, factoring high in national importance, like has, it's kind of a a snowball or maybe even like a self-licking ice cream cone. Like it's a, it's a solution in search of a problem. And that concerns me though, because it feels like we have so many examples of, you know, great ideas like militarizing the cops getting turned into like this horrible situation we've got now. And you could, you could see like, okay, maybe that's a worst case scenario, but it could very easily become a reality that, you know, the way people live in like the, the, you know, border areas of Afghanistan and Pakistan might have more in common in terms of like them being constantly surveilled by drones. And the fact that like, you know, there's places like Miram Shah, Pakistan, where it, it basically sounds like a lawnmower in the sky all the time when, when it's a sunny day because there's so many drones. Like that could become the reality uh, in certain places in the United States. And, and that, that should concern people because of what it represents. Yeah, it just seems like a technological solution to what is essentially a political problem, uh, which nobody wants to discuss. And that, and that problem is a very simple question. Why are people coming here? Yeah. Why are people leaving their homes, their ancestral homes, or their families and, and the language that they speak and the culture that, that they're familiar with? Why? Nobody wants to ask that question. Yeah. Well, Ken, thank you so much for coming on. These are two great stories. I'm going to link to them in the show notes. I really appreciate you making time. And I, I figured we'd give you a little bit of a chance to plug both your current work, where people can follow you, and also like if people want, you know, working in various agencies, et cetera, if they're listening for some reason, and they, uh, they want to <laughs> help you uh, get a better picture of what's going on, how they can contact you. 
Yeah, I'm on Signal. It's an encrypted uh, texting app that's free. Uh, you can text me at 202-510-1268. You would actually not be the first uh, uh, source that I've gotten from the show. So uh, take comfort in that. <laughs> that rules. Glad <laughs> and, to hear it. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I'm at, at Ken Klippenstein on Twitter. And then uh, my writing is all on The Intercept. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much again. It's been great speaking to you. We're glad to have you on the show again and look forward to speaking sometime soon. Good talking to you, man. Yeah, have a good one. 